Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Khan from um, Executive Plastic Surgery, Michigan. Um, and I want to go ahead and welcome each one of you to another Facebook Live. Um, today, I will go ahead and talk about specific topics, specifically the usage of drains. And then also, I will uh, touch base on some of the questions that have been asked uh, so that we can help understand what is breast implant illness. I want to go ahead and welcome all the new members that have come on and uh, that basically will uh, hopefully learn as to how I do it as a board certified plastic uh, surgeon. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm a board certified general surgeon. This is where I got my general surgery training and then uh, I did burns and then following that uh, three years of plastics training where I am a board certified plastic surgeon by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. So this is the only one and only board that recognizes plastic surgeons mm -hmm. uh, and uh, basically authenticates them to practice uh, plastic surgery in a very professional manner. And I will go ahead and also emphasize the fact that plastic surgeons are also hand surgeons because of the, uh, the nature of the training and almost a fourth of what we do as far as training and exams that entails uh, hand surgery, which is much more complex if you ask me compared to what would be the chest surgery, i.e. explantation. Now, another thing I want to highlight is the fact that if anyone were to talk to or go to 10 different explant specialists who claim to be explant specialists, I will assure you with confidence, you're probably going to get with ease 10 different answers. And within their practice, what would be 10 different variations of how they practice depending on how the patients present to their uh, clinic. So for example, the young healthy patient will get the supposed end block and then uh, the sicker patients, for example, would get, for example, patients on uh, immunomodulators or Humira or prednisone chronically uh, will end up getting what would be a substandard treatment. And again, I know this because eventually all of this trickles into my clinic. And I say this to everyone, the 100 100 zero rule applies to everyone, which is 100% of the time, 100% of the capsule is removed in all patients, and 0% of the capsule remains behind. And also, any inflamed tissue must be removed because if it looks abnormal, feels abnormal, it feels hard, it must be removed. Otherwise, uh, that burden will be left behind, and we never know what it is till the pathologist weighs in on this. As you have seen in the many Facebook lives that I've done in the last four to six weeks, there is fat necrosis that has been found. There are other pockets of what is residual silicon that has bled out, micro bled into the periphery and had just the capsule been removed and that uh, inflamed tissue left behind, the fat necrosis in which there are the macrophages and the silica and also these pockets of silicon would be left behind and despite what would be a good end block the residual silica slash silicon toxicity would continue to burden the patient and hurt the patient and the patient would not have a good speedy recovery or will continue to have sign symptoms of what is a breast implant illness despite what would be supposedly a good uh, end block. So it is imperative. If you look at uh, one of the uh, videos that I did almost three weeks ago from the hospital, this was a small pocket of silicone that was contained within the periphery of the capsule uh, and had just the capsule being removed along with the implant and that pocket remained behind, the patient would inevitably continue to be hurt and the silicon mastitis fat necrosis would continue. So as you will see, I'm going to go ahead and post a, another pathology report that pretty much states as such. I want to go ahead and mention, uh, you know, the, the mo single most important question that I get asked repeatedly is the usage of drains. And I'm going to go ahead and dwell on this and I'm going to go ahead and post some other videos. So to, uh, to date this year, I have not used drains at all. Zero drains used in the many patients that I have done where almost 90, 95% of my practice is explant surgery. In any of the saline or silicone patients and the many, many, many patients that I have done that I have had ruptured silicone, where I've been able to remove the entirety of the implant and capsule definitively 
in in n block fashion and in a contained 100 percent uh, total capsulectomy such that there has been no spillage and because the surgery is done in a very sophisticated dedicated religious way in that avascular plane which is the bloodless plane the need for drains is not there and as you will see a hundred percent of the time those cosmetic patients, I go ahead and make the incision right at the inframammary crease. And as soon as I go in uh, after in making an incision with a 15 blade, I dissect with my bovicari, which is the standard of care. And then I essentially dive down to where that capsule is. Once I identify the capsule, then in a very meticulous, sophisticated way, I dissect literally millimeter by millimeter with utmost concern and care taking into consideration those many outpouchings, that irregular fatty tissue that is there on top of the capsule where I feel and I basically intuitively six sense and I know and I visualize bad fat, which is darker, more necrotic appearing compared to the healthy fat. And I know from my palpation, if this is indurated or hard tissue, I essentially incorporate that with the capsule such that when I do get done, as you will see in my many uh, YouTube videos, uh, unfortunately, Facebook will not allow for me to post these graphic videos. You will see the many, many, all the videos where there is a bloodless field and uh, my blood loss is approximately five, three cc's, five cc's each side on almost 95, 97% of my cases. And this is where the utmost care and dissection is carried out such that the need for drains is not there. These are, this is true on patients who have been on blood thinners, on aliquots who have been bridged with Lovenox. This is true for patients who have been on aspirin. This is true for patients who quote easily bleed. This is true for patients who have been on prednisone. This is also true for patients who have had 600, 800 cc implants. And again, this is where I dissect in that very meticulous, defined way. And all one, one needs to do is just look at some of my YouTube videos and you will see essentially when I do get done, like I did today on my two mastectomy patients uh, where I had an extensive area over six ribs where the implant was sitting and the need for the drain was not there simply because I dissected in that avascular plane in a very sophisticated, meticulous, dedicated way where I millimeter by millimeter dissected. Now, this is how I have done my hand surgeries. This is how I done the, my face reconstructions, for example, uh, skin cancer of the face where up till now, I have not used bovicautery on the face, for example, if I've removed the basal cell cancer or a squamous cell cancer because of that bloodless plane that I'm able to dissect in. And I use uh, that technique in a very sophisticated way so my blood loss is minimal. Now, when I do dissect in that avascular plane, I'm not anywhere near any of the nerves. I'm not cutting through the muscle. In the vast majority of the cases, I'm not distorting the breast tissue. I'm not cutting in the proximity of the nipple areola. And as a result, the patients, as they will attest in the numbers and in the masses, where the need for the pain medications is minimal, there is preservation of the aesthetics, and the patients overall uh, do so well where they're surprised that the post-operative course has been relatively very benign, and it was... Uh, literally a very uneventful post-operative course where you, where you will see vast majority of my patients are taking uh, maybe a leaf or Tylenol or Tramadol maybe for a day or two along with the Norcos. So this is again that avascular plane, that very meticulous uh, tedious dissection. And the examples that I've given in the past is, you know, if you have a classroom with, for example, uh, 30 kids, and you ask them to color uh, with a crayon, uh, basically a black crayon, the entirety of the page. There's someone in the class that would literally cover a uh, color uh, within 30 seconds and say done. And it will be, as you can see, a quick, speedy, uh, uh, you know, a coloring where you can see that there was no finesse and no sophistication and essentially what would be a no cure. Now, the other a student, for example, who takes his or her time to dissect in a very, or in this case, color in a very nice, clear, defined way, 
such that it requires a lot of concentration and it requires a very thoughtful way of coloring such that at their end result you have a nice even array uh, of the crayon that is exactly what it entails and it's not a matter of being slow i've been told well he's slow on average i book my patients with my patients for four hours and as many of my patients will attest uh, almost two-thirds of the time are well over the four hours and i actually take pride in taking time Three weeks ago, I took care of a lady uh, that works uh, with the governor's office and I spent three hours alone on one side and she had a severe grade four contracture. And uh, this is how long it took me uh, to dissect onto the, on the right side. This is a patient, she was so inflamed, she actually called me, I gave her an emergency date, uh, like within 10 days, she texted me and said, I need to go sooner, I cannot wait uh, that long. And I booked her on the very next uh, Tuesday. And this is uh, the point being uh, where she was, she had so much inflammation to the point where her primary care doctor called me and said, I want to start her on antibiotics. And I did not want her because she did not have an exam that was consistent with an infection. Now, what's interesting is I did another case as what I referred to as that white paint that was all contained with the end block. And again, to my surprise, my very first case, this was actually consistent with what is bacteria, all contained in the end block, which is the gold standard. And this is what every surgeon needs to be striving for and focused that this is essentially what is going to be the desired goal and treatment for the patient. And in this case, with the white paint, as you have seen in the video, that has had a lot of reviews, not only within the US, but internationally. This was an infection and there was a lot of bacteria all contained in the end block. And in this case, she not only had relief of her many BI symptoms, but in this case, this was actually, uh, uh, the end block was uh, essentially saved her life. If you can imagine that surgeon who was not meticulous in that dissection, this inevitably would have spilled, i.e. the bacterial colonies within the chest and the patient would have had this bacterial burden within uh, the chest tissue and ultimately this would have had led to what would be sepsis, infection, uh, bacteremia and likely a visit uh, to the intensive care unit in order to monitor the hemodynamics and also likely a washout of the chest if not absolute usage of drains. So again, the end block is the gold standard, and this is what I say. Uh, 20 years from now, I cannot imagine the surgery being done any differently. Uh, and the point here is that the entirety of the implant capsule plus any inflamed tissue is removed definitively. If I'm ever sitting on the fence, should I or should I not remove it? I will remove it because till the pathologist looks at it under the microscope, we won't know the consistency of this uh, tissue and because it looks abnormal, feels abnormal, and having done so many surgeries, I can tell that this needs to go because it does not belong in the body. Then, as you will see, the many masses that I have sent, it comes back as the giant cell reaction, the silicon mastitis, the silica, the, uh, the macrophages, and amongst the many other uh, sign symptoms suggestive of what is inflammation, acute and chronic inflammation. Now going back to, there are so many patients that I have seen where they had a 90 minute surgery, a two hour surgery where there was two sets of capsules removed. And I will tell you, this cannot be done effectively from a two and a half centimeter incision. This cannot be done from a nipple areola incision dissecting through the muscle and dissecting off of the rib. The, this needs to be done very really sincerely. This is where your plastic surgeon must be 100% committed in his or her mind that the end block is curative and the end block is what the patient needs. And the many patients who have had successful removal of the entire implant and capsule and that definitive removal of the implant capsule was done religiously, faithfully, because that is what is ultimately going to lead to what is going to be a uh, good bounce back and an effective bounce back right after surgery. Now, there are many patients that I've seen where they have gone and I am going to send another video out. This one lady, she came to me uh, from Alabama and she had deliberate puncture of the implants by a reputable board certified plastic surgeon in her home state. 
and who punctured the saline implant in order to, quote, normalize the breast tissue such that a determination would then be made for removal of the implant and then maybe a lift that is going to be required or not. And then she came to me with textured uh, punctured implants and I removed the entirety of the implant plus the capsule. And the idea and the point here is it should the implant absolutely must not and cannot be punctured because that is not the, what I would say is the standard of care. The saline implant intact must be returned to the patient and also the silicone implant so that the patients know what was the implant that was removed and what is the status of the saline implant. Very important. Now, another thing if I must uh, mention is majority of the implants are below the muscle or under the muscle and the entirety of the dissection is done underneath the muscle on top of the rib and then the superior part where the implant capsule depending on the size it may serve as a challenge for the surgeon to remove effectively you have to have optimal visualization if you don't you're going to leave ie as a plastic surgeon uh, the capsule behind and the surgeon needs to believe in her mind sincerely that the bi exists the breast implant illness exists if the surgeon does not believe or is skeptical that BI exists or does not truly believe, then I assure you with confidence that the plastic surgeon is not going to be committed into removing the whole capsule. So going back to what I said are the five criteria that everyone needs to look at and strongly consider. And as you will see, these are relatively very logical five points that essentially enhance, confirm, authenticate, and uh, remove the doubt in the patient's mind that the surgery was done in the right fashion. Number one, the length of the incision. It cannot be two or three centimeters like one of my other patients from Chicago who I talked to stated that her incision is two and a half centimeters and the entirety of the capsule and implant was removed. You cannot remove such a big implant from uh, just a two and a half centimeters. Number two, the length of time. You cannot do the surgery in an hour, hour and a half. This is on average from my experience of four hour surgery, this is how much I allocate the time to such that the need for the drains, the recovery and all of that is done very effectively. And this is what and how I book my patients. No more uh, than three cases have I done in a day. And uh, I do not, for this reason, focus on doing the lifts. Remember the entirety of the implant capsule plus the inflamed tissue that's present is below the muscle in the vast majority of the cases. That in itself is a four hour commitment. If someone were to come, now this is an important point. If someone were to come and says that I want to lift and she has no implants, for example, she does not want an explant, she does not have implants and she just wants a mastopexy where the tissue is removed and the nipple areola is removed such that there is a lollipop incision and an anchor incision that remains such that the aesthetics of the breasts are carried out where a lift is done. That operation in itself is three to four hours and it baffles my mind how surgeons do what is an end block or 100% uh, total capsulectomy and a lift in the three hours uh, where I'm just taking three hours sometimes to do a, re a relatively very involved case. And these two operations should be staged. They should not be done at the same time. For what is a surgery below the section off of the rib where I'm removing not only the periosteum but sometimes the perichondrium which is the layer of tissue directly on top of the rib because I'm not scraping. I'm actually essentially removing the fascia of the intercostal. And this is basically what it entails to effectively and definitively remove the entirety of the capsule off of the rib, which is the hardest part of the whole operation. And you cannot rush through the surgery. And so a surgery that I normally take four hours to do from start to finish along what would in itself would be a lift, which in itself is a three, four hour operation. And that being done in three minutes, you can see uh, that commitment is essentially to a lift and not truly to an end block. And you can see the, the, the results of what would be an ineffective, incomplete uh, end block. And the word end block would not apply. In this case, would be a partial capsulectomy that would necessitate the need for drains because you would have the residual inflammatory burden left behind. And again, it's not about the speed. It's about the intelligence of the plastic surgeon truly committed into removing the entirety of the capsule because this is truly what is explant surgery. 
So going back to the five criteria, number one, the length of the incision essentially should be the diameter of the implant where the implant essentially crawls out. Number two, the length of time. It should be on average four hours from my experience very humbly. Um, number three, the implant must be returned to the patient. You don't want a punctured implant or the, the, the hospital doesn't allow implants to be returned. I work at a hospital where the committee said the implants cannot be returned. I talked to the committee, the pathologist, and I said, what are you going to do with the implants? You're going to essentially throw them away and you're just going to have them in a box. This is the patient's property. They paid for it. And because it's not in any formaldehyde or any uh, uh, preservative, this is relatively safe. It was in the patient's body and it certainly is safe to be given to a patient in a container. So the implants need to be returned because you want to make sure that the saline implant or the silicon implant is exactly what was removed and what is the consistency of the implant. Number four, the surgeon must take not only the pictures of the implant capsule on the table where he's cutting it out, but a video of the capsule being cut out. But most importantly, the video of the chest itself showing complete and definitive removal of the implant capsule such that there is no capsule remaining behind. And this is the ultimate of all the tests that shows that the dissection was carried out and with the right headlight and the right lights in the OR that there is clear documentation via a video that shows that there is no capsule left behind because that is the ultimate of all the proofs. And five, the reputation of the surgeon. As you will see, there are many surgeons who have, after some time, a social media presence and it will not take much for one patient to talk to another and say, well, there are some surgeons who supposedly are on that list because of financial gains. They're able to get their names up and uh, get what would be a VIP slash or a enhanced authenticated uh, review by another Facebook owner, which is all based on financial, uh, basically, uh, donations and not essentially on what would be considered to be uh, uh, effective end blocks or effective breast implant uh, uh, explant surgery. Uh, so one has to be very, very. The other thing I want to mention is anyone who takes insurance and does supposedly an end block cannot be getting the right surgery. The reimbursement for uh, basically an explant is essentially minimal to none. You're looking at anywhere from $600 to $1,200, $1,500, which will not justify a surgeon spending four hours removing what would be a very involved uh, surgery. This is going to be a chapter 11, a recipe for chapter 11. If a surgeon takes um, uh, insurances to remove uh, what would be the capsules plus the implant plus any inflamed tissue, just given the nature and the length of the surgery itself. And nowadays, anyone, quote, quote me please, anyone who takes insurance for whatever any purpose it may be for medical reasons who is in private practice will not be able to be reimbursed in a very uh, uh, in a very uh, reasonable way such that he or she will be able to float their private practice uh, because this is something that is not recognized another thing i want to highlight is you know what we saw last week this is where the FDA stepped up to a very limited extent and they basically are now going to have the plastic surgeons quote discuss actively with their prospective patients the risks of what would be the augmentation meaning the 10 to 15 years the risk for BIALCL not only with textured implants but also soft uh, and uh, smooth uh, saline or silicon implants and also the fact that uh, breast implant illness exists and there is a constellation of signs of symptoms. We, and I do not know how effectively that's going to get translated such that these patients are truly going to be made aware of the risk versus benefits, but this is a very bold but incomplete step in the right direction. They should have just stepped up and banned the implants, which is right around the corner, because this is hopefully going to be the deterrent for the patients to basically state that they're not going to get something that there are three what are very significant warnings. These are not to be taken lightly. And uh, the patients need to comprehend and understand that implants are not safe. And implants are not safe for many reasons. I'm taking, making, I made another video just yesterday, the, the top 10 reasons why implants are not safe. And as you will see, number one, and just going back to 
Implants, uh, number one, compromise the pectoralis muscle where it inserts into the upper arm and compromises the upper arm function. Number two, because of the implants, they obscure what would be a good physical exam. And many patients, including the one that I did today, did not want to and choose to get a mammogram because it would hurt or potentially rupture the implant. Number three, they're associated with capsular contracture. They're associated with pain. They're associated with lymphoma. Uh, BIA, ALCL, which is the breast implant associated anaplastic large and lymphoma. They're associated with bacterial colonization infections. They're associated with pain. They're associated with multiple surgeries in lip nipples. Um, and they're also associated with, uh, other, uh, multiple other surgeries that unfortunately need to be done as a result of malpositioning, mis, uh, bottoming out, um, and, uh, other, uh, uh, scar effects as a result of what would be uh, the augmentation. So again, a lot of reasons, uh, you know, and what is breast cancer? One out of eight or nine women get breast cancer. If a lady is not getting mammograms because she's afraid that the implants may get rupture or she's not able to feel a mass, which is the most common reason why women pick up on uh, breast uh, cancer, and it obscures what would be a late um, uh, uh, physical exam, both not only by the OBGYN or the primary care, but also by the patient. This is not what would be a sound uh, uh, reason to go ahead and uh, augment. Also, if I may mention, which was clearly shown by my guest, Dr. Henry Dijkman out of the Netherlands, there is gel bleed that is occurring. Very clear evidence, both by electron microscopy and also by energy dispersive x-rays that clearly shows that the silica is not only present within the capsule, but within the lymph nodes and the neighboring tissue and in the biopsies that he has done on the patients, that it is present in the spleen and the connective tissues and the many other organ systems, essentially every system of the body, uh, being the skin, the nerves, that leads to the many tingling numbness or the headaches or the upper neck and back pain, the constellation of what is breast implant illness. Now, what I want to do is um, I want to go ahead and answer uh, some of the questions that I got asked, which I thought were very good. Um, I want to go ahead and emphasize some other points. Uh, you know, there are patients uh, who have gone to plastic surgeons who have said, that my surgeon still augments uh, is not a true believer. And I will tell you, if this is not where someone can say that the earth is flat, but also the earth is round at the same time. If you believe in breast implant illness, you have to f not augment. And this is, you cannot have it both ways. And someone who sincerely and is committed for the betterment of health of their patients and Look at the FDA warning. Look at the fact that they've been banned before. Look at all the history pitting itself, all these problems. Any reasonable plastic surgeon with the right frame of mind cannot augment and say breast implant illness exists because they're having it now uh, a convenience for them to kind of accept more patients, which is absolutely 100% unacceptable and wrong. Sorry to be blunt because Breast implant illness affects 100% of the patients. Now, someone asked me this patient and uh, this question, and I said to them, and they said, prove to me that it affects 100%. And I said, look at the fact that implants are not meant to be in the body forever. The last 10 to 15 years, then they ruptured, they cause all these other problems. And that in itself was good enough an answer for them to say, well, okay, I get your point. No one is ever going to state like the many ladies have stated their plastic surgeon told them the implants last in the body forever and they absolutely do not. They have a certain lifespan. Sometimes as early as six days, I had a patient who came to me a month ago and she just got augmented six days ago. She had not even seen her uh, primary plastic surgeon who did the augmentation six days ago. And she came to me for an explant. I told her, well, in six days, there is no capsule. Just go ahead and get your same plastic surgeon to remove your implant and there is no need for removal and it will be a quick fast surgery uh, because the implant just needs to be removed from the same incision and uh, you know that would be the best bet well her plastic surgeon unfortunately thought that she was crazy and literally she used the word crazy to quote my patient uh, and unfortunately this is what uh, she was told when she told uh, her plastic surgeon in regards to removal so it's very important now, one thing I'm reminded of by another patient of mine that came from South Dakota, and uh, she said, 
Within three minutes, she had made up her mind, and I've mentioned this on my other Facebook lives. Uh, she mentioned uh, that I'm coming to you within three minutes from the time it took for me to walk from my clinic to my car. And I said, no, you have to ask me more questions because I am afraid you might just change your mind or you might not be. She said, well, I've been following you on Facebook and I know the two things that you do that kind of have convinced me you are my plastic surgeon. And the first thing she said that you uh, do not augment. And I said, absolutely, 100%. And that for sole reason for me to not augment is I don't want to hurt no one. And, you know, this is part of that oath that I've taken. I want to help each and every single patient. And I don't want to feed my family or enjoy what would be a financial gain out of someone else's misery. And she knew that and she had done her homework. And the second thing she said that you returned implants and I see what you do from the Facebook lives, from the OR, from pre and post and how and what you have done, the way you talk. And I said, absolutely, I got your point and I can see totally if I put myself in your shoes. And this is the level of commitment. Don't rush into a surgery. Here's a patient uh, who spent uh, three years before she made up her mind and this is what it took for her. For this other patient, it took her literally from what she said, three minutes. There's another patient and she's gonna be my next Facebook uh, Live. I'm actually gonna do an in person live interview. She's going to be sitting right across from me. She actually sought consultation from 32 plastic surgeons. That is correct. 32 plastic surgeons, half of which were in person. And we're going to listen to her because she is a nurse. She is charged. She is educated. Uh, and BI, she can, if I give her a marker and a board, she can give a lecture on breast implant illness. And she is so well versed and she knows uh, the many different surgeons she has talked to and we will learn from her. I will learn from her like I do on all my patients so that she can help us better understand what was going through her thought process and what is it that she looked at in the many different plastic surgeons and what her uh, experience was and how uh, and what the feedback was. And again, that is critical. And I ask every single patient to basically critique me. I asked the other plastic surgeons to critique me, um, you know, and uh, this is what I was saying earlier. If you go to 10 different plastic surgeons, you're probably gonna get easily 10 different answers and within their practices, you're gonna get the 10 different answers. So as far as my practice goes as an explant specialist, I have the defined 100-100-0 rule. 100% of the time I remove 100% of the capsule with 0% of the capsule behind, remaining behind because I know in my mind my patients bounce back her recovery when she's back in her home state is truly dependent on me doing my job sincerely, faithfully with care and absolute 100% respect for the patient because this is the bond that she and I have and I know the implants are bad. One of my patients from Texas, she said, you know, she did her research just like this nice patient and she said, you're the only plastic surgeon in the US that she knows of who has never augmented as a board certified plastic surgeon. And I said, you bet, you are right. For me, I chose deliberately, purposefully to not augment because I did not want to hurt. And I did that only one case in order to get board certified on a cancer patient because I don't want to hurt anyone. And I knew something from within my heart all what you need to do is look at some of the videos and you will be convinced from your heart that this is not a safe operation. It is not a wise operation. And this is an operation that is absolutely not worth it given the risk versus benefits and the ultimate price that the patients have to pay in order to relieve themselves of what is uh, the explant surgery, which in itself is financially and post-operatively uh, relatively an involved operation, much more involved than when patients get augmented, for example. Uh, now, uh, what I want to do is, you know, unfortunately, I continue to keep seeing patients who are sick, uh, type 1 diabetics, uh, bad rheumatoid arthritis, patients who have had lupus, and unfortunately, plastic surgeons and other docs, unfortunately, continue to augment these patients who are relatively sick, diabetics. Uh, and this is uh, sad to hear that this is the, uh, the, the patients that they continue to augment for what is not a safe operation. For example, I heard that I've mentioned this, one of my neighbors uh, ended up getting augmented uh, and she has history of a kidney transplant, which is absolutely, uh, you know, a compromised, immunocompromised state for the patient. And she ended up getting uh, what would be a, uh, 
uh, and uh, augmentation, which certainly will continue to be a burden for the patient for a higher number of infection, wound dehiscence, amongst the many other problems that these transplant patients have. I want to go ahead and mention, and then I'll answer some questions. The way how I do it differently, as you will see the con procedure, and again, humbly, this is why I am different. Last year, I put only three drains. This year, zero drains on all my patients. Um, so with, within the last, like, uh, you know, and the many years that uh, I have done the surgeries, even tummy tucks, for example, that I have done, I have not needed the need for drains because of that avascular plane and the quilting sutures, for example, that I have put. Now, as far as the procedure, how I do it differently, number one, the twilight anesthesia, which is very safe, very effective. Look at how many patients snore through my surgery. Number two, no need for drains. Number three, the lift. As you will see, the entire surgery is done below the muscle. The lift is all above. Each one of these is a three, four hour operation. You don't want to combine the two. You need to stage them. And as you will see, almost 80% of my patients don't need a lift. Number four, the implants are returned to the patient. Number five, 100% of the time, the capsule is sent to pathology. It must be sent because if BIALCL or breast uh, cancer or any other abnormal pathology is not ruled out, we will not know why it happened. And for this reason, BIALCL is underreported because not many people are sending capsules. Sometimes they're not sending capsules because they don't want the proof in the pathology lab as to how, quote, incomplete a job or a partial capsulectomy was done. Uh, number six, uh, the microbiology, aerobic, anaerobic, and fungal cultures are done so that we know there are 10-15% of the time bacteria that are associated with the implants. We need to know what they are. As you can see, there are there is mold that I have found on three of my patients and they have sought consultation from my direction with their infectious disease doc such that they can get the definitive post-operative antibiotics so that they don't have residual fungus remaining behind. Uh, number seven, the implants are always returned to the patient 100% uh, of the time. Even that one patient from Brazil, she did not want to take her pay implants and she thought that this was kind of a bad demon to take to her home and her kids, the three kids. And I said, okay, I understand, but she's the only one who have not uh, returned the implants to. And according to her, uh, I honored her words. Uh, and number uh, eight, you have to take the picture videos uh, of the chest itself showing complete definitive removal of the capsule and no capsule remaining behind. And this is the bond where the plastic surgeon who's not augmenting preferably will sincerely, truly, professionally do the right surgery because this is what the patient wants. The last thing anyone, any patient would want is to undergo a surgery and then to undergo a second surgery to remove the residual uh, capsules or the burden remaining behind because the first surgery was not done right. And there are so many patients that I talk to on a regular and a daily basis where unfortunately the word end block is used and you see all these tears in the capsules. And unfortunately, some of the surgeons uh, don't comprehend what is uh, end block uh, explantation. Now going back to... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and look at some questions uh, that I have. Uh, uh, um, so one of the questions that I got asked was, what testing will I need to get done prior to scheduling? So you want to make sure that you've had uh, the full set of labs uh, such that there is nothing left behind. You know, you want to make sure you don't have diabetes. Uh, there are many people who have diabetes and don't even know they have diabetes. So you want to make sure that your thyroid function test is good and your rheumatological workup, CRP, ESR, inflammatory markers are okay. And this is the workup that your primary care doctor will do because you don't want to come to me like one patient. She had a high TSH, which means her thyroid level was very low. Uh, and she needed to get supplemented. And she said, I don't want to get a thyroid, uh, synthroid uh, in my system because I feel this is my implants. No, she has to go, she has to get normalized because hypothyroidism, low thyroid, will result and mimic the many sign symptoms of breast implant illness. So you have to get the TSH. You want to make sure that you have had a mammogram. You don't want to be uh, you know, like one lady came, she was 12 years, 52 years of age with no uh, mammogram. You don't want to miss what is breast cancer. You want to do your homework. You want to make sure that everything is done well. You don't want, I do not want to be running into what would be a mass of the chest because that needs to be worked up and potentially breast cancer needs to be ruled out. Um, so 
a series of lab tests, a good physical exam, and clearance by your doctor that your heart is good. Um, if that is certainly indeed what needs to be done, or another patient that got cardioversion, cardioablation, for example, you know, these are sick patients. Patients, for example, she had a stage four breast cancer with metastases to the neck. I need to know uh, what is the status of the pericardial window. Now, these are very uh, involved patients that I will dedicate and I take to the hospital because these are patients that belong to the hospital and not um, uh, within the surgery center. Uh, the next patient is uh, the armpit side fat. I thought that I heard uh, him say in a video that he tags sutures down what he does when he does the explantation. I have seen some women after picks and other groups after explant that uh, part sticks way out, not Dr. Khan. I was also wondering if he doesn't do anything uh, with it during the explant. Does he tighten or bind uh, or the fat? So what I do, I have my special and again this is that sixth sense to intuition where the ladies that have had a lot of adipose fatty tissue and because of the purchase that i make with my big 3-0 vicral needle i'm able to incorporate some of the tissue bring it together and what it does is as the muscle sits on the rib in vast majority of the cases where the implant is below it allows for what is a pseudo lift where the breast tissue lifts up and when the inflammation subsides and when the patients wear their bra and then binder it causes a pseudo lift as well and allows for retraction of what would be the cooper's ligaments of the breast and also the fat that is ultimately pulled in that gives a pseudo lift and that certainly is a technique that i've used now it varies a patient with a BMI of 18 is relatively tougher, harder to do than the patient who has a BMI of, for example, uh, 32. Uh, so these are two very different patients and I'm certainly able to very smartly, carefully mobilize and what is plastic surgery, mobilize the tissue such that I'm able to uh, move the tissue into where it needs to belong and gives the patient what is a pseudo lift without any incisions around the nipple areola. Now those are the patients where the incision was made around the nipple areola and as you can imagine, uh, those are the patients that are I find the toughest because once the surgeon, if you can imagine, you're the plastic surgeon who made the incision at the inferior or the lower aspect of the nipple areola, you cut through the nerves, the ducts, the breast tissue, the muscle, and then ultimately put the implant below the muscle. Now when they do come out, they're suturing, repairing the fat, the muscle to an extent and what happens inevitably, once the implants are removed by the explant surgeon, that divot, that scar tissue becomes more enhanced and more noticeable as a result. Now, what do I do to the nipple areola, the breast tissue, or anything including the muscle and above? Nothing, because that's an area that I don't need to touch. So I preserve the aesthetics and I'm always operating below because that is the area that I need to be always in the avascular plane, not doing anything unnecessary. Because if I do, then I'm only cutting through the nerves, disrupting the normal breast parenchyma and only compromising what would be the aesthetics. Uh, more and more women are choosing to go flat after implants, sometimes not related to breast cancer. Are you seeing this? So it is not fair for the patient if she has not had breast cancer to go flat. Now this is, it has to be a justification. So my first patient today, she actually had what was a nipple spearing mastectomy and she had some residual uh, breast tissue underneath the nipple areola and she had history of breast cancer. Now she opted, she was supposed to get uh, chemo, but because, because of one of the lymph nodes was positive, but because of the technicalities and five months later, they concluded that the patient needed it. And again, very unique kind of out of the ordinary case. I talked to the patient and I said, you know, in this case, you have the risk for residual, i.e. potential cancer that can occur. You have to rule out malignancy. There is, to answer this question definitively, no reason to go flat when there is no history of breast cancer and you have even the small amount of breast tissue that in itself is better than having no nipple, no areola, and having no subcutaneous tissue in general. Now, there are patients that have come to me that three of their sisters had breast cancer and she was afraid she had three young kids and she on her own subjectively sought consultation from a breast surgeon and she got a mastectomy because she said, now I don't want to even think about breast cancer, so that 
Now that is between her and her choice, but there is no reason in my mind as a board certified general surgeon in the past and a board certified plastic surgeon to go what would be an unnecessary oval care operation if there is no risk for breast cancer, if you will. You can certainly, yes, God had intended to you to be cup A, so accept the fact and move on and preserving, quote, that aesthetics that is still better than being completely flat chested because this is not what I would say you deserve. Now, having said this, the patient needs to make an informed consent. I would never recommend someone to go flat because this is a choice because they're getting an explant. Majority of the patients do relatively well uh, given the nature of the implants that they have and how the explantation is done. And if they're ever not happy, they can certainly get a lift later on if so they desire. The first operation is to get healthy. So all those check boxes from the BII need to be addressed definitively so the patient can sleep better, eat, run, eat, all those signs symptoms of BII, including the psych component, the headaches, the dryness of the mouth, eyes, neck and head. We need to address that first before we dwell into what would be the aesthetics because we don't want to com compound the two surgeries. These are two separate surgeries and they need to be staged. So to answer the question again, if there is no fear of cancer or risk for cancer, you should and one should not think of getting a flat chest just so that that's the trend. Uh, we're going by physiology and also preservation of the aesthetics. What percentage of saline implants have you found have fat necrosis? Now, what's interesting is some patients, the capsules are so thin. Some patients look hard calcified even with the saline implants on the many Facebook lives I've done. So one cannot conclude right and left or, you know, sometimes look that one patient where I did the three hour explant end block on the right and on the left I did one hour and 15 minutes, two different um, surgeries on the same patient. So each side needs to have a dedicated removal and uh, the Fat necrosis can occur with saline implants or silicon implants, and both are equally bad. No, no one should and must say definitively with absolute certainty that saline implants are safer than silicone. Yes, when they do rupture, but guess what? The same havoc, the same destructive nature of what is seen in silicon implants is seen also in saline implants. So the same saline implants cause the ground glass opacities, the giant cell reaction, the contracture, the infection, all these other problems uh, that are seen with silicone. And this is just like what I've stated in the past. A cigarette with a long, nice filter is not safer than what would be a cigar. Both cause cancer and both are equally bad. And both are associated with anaplastic uh, large lymphoma, even the smooth ones, as you have seen the FDA highlight. Uh, the next, um, so... Uh, what can be done, uh, so I'm seeing the next question, uh, uh, what can be done in regards to uh, the detox? Now I'll tell you the best and the only detox that exists is doing the right pristine surgery where the entirety of the implant capsule is removed along with any inflamed tissue. As you have seen that inflamed tissue has had the fat necrosis, the giant cells amongst the, any other problems. Putting your uh, feet in infrared sauna or the body or taking charcoal, taking vitamin C, all of this, sorry to be blunt, is garbage. Uh, taking supplements, uh, garbage, sorry to be blunt. Uh, if that was the case, uh, all the cirrhotics, the patients with liver failure or kidney failure would be doing that or the patients with BII would be improving, right? No, that is not the case. The one, I should be taking vitamin C. So if I take an orange a day, or I eat some lemon a day that meets my requirements for what is vitamin C. I don't need to get vitamin C toxicity. Same thing with vitamin D. You can measure the vitamin D in the blood and if it's low, especially postmenopausal women, not only vitamin D, but the calcium needs to be supplemented. The bone density test needs to be done. Probiotics, look, how many people get colonoscopies? Millions of them, their entire gut is cleaned out, right? And there's clear water, i.e. when they go for a colonoscopy, how many times does the gastroenterologist tell them you have to take probiotics to replenish the, the bacteria? Zero. How many times people with uh, diarrhea at the hospital, they, do they give out uh, probiotics? Zero. The body in itself, if you take yogurt, the lactobacillus, if you can tolerate, then absolutely by all means, 
uh, taking the yogurt, but over time, if you eat a healthy diet, you will be able to replenish that on your own. So taking this uh, arnica, look, millions and billions of surgeries are done all over in the history in the last 5, 10, 15 years, right? How many times was arnica prescribed in order to get a better result? Now, this is sure it has been shown, but if you look, some of these have a bad effect such as bleeding. It helps certainly, but this is not what would be a defined standard of care. The defined standard of care is removing the entirety of the implant capsule plus any inflamed tissue such that there is no burden left behind and that is your best and only detox. No other detox. Don't spend money uh, going to these quote naturopath docs who say herbal medication because you know they make the product. This is not graded or regulated by the FDA. This is not regulated by the pharmaceutical industry. This is kind of sometimes made in China or overseas. It has no quality control. One product may be just chalk, the other one may be overdosed 10 times what may be vitamin C. No one regulates that to my surprise and it's a billion dollar industry. Yes, it has been shown that turmeric is good. It's been shown and you can take that. Garlic is good but within reason as a natural organic product. Everything avoid the fatty foods, the fast foods, the pop, uh, Coke, Pepsi, all bad detrimental to the body as we all know with the high sugar content. Now, how the patients have, and we have heard from Dr. Henry Dykman and then uh, Dr. Atul Mehta and the other reports that have been published where there is silicon within the lymph nodes that's within embedded, I say to you, look at the macrophages, and again, I'm trying to learn. I'm not a toxicologist by any means, but this is if you put the two and two cents together. The body in itself has these macrophages, the giant cell uh, reaction, which is a cluster of macrophages. Macrophages, if you Google, M-A-C-R-O-P-H-A-G-E-S, macrophages. These are the body's quote, uh, cells that clean up debris, uh, particulate matter, foreign body, and the cluster is giant cell reaction. These them, themselves process and the body in itself eliminates over time. And so the body in itself will, once the burden is removed, this is just like saying, if I may use an analogy, you take dye, a red dye, for example, and you throw it in the swimming pool and you see it's gel bleeding, if you will, the dye into the pool and you see a high concentration of it in the bottom where it has settled. Now this is the implant, if you will, that is slowly gel bleeding, i.e. the silicon and dispersing it into the body. We know this from Atul Mehta, the Cleveland Clinic pulmonologist who showed clearly with electron microscopy, just like Dr. Henry Dykman, uh, that electron microscopy and energy dispersive x-rays, two separate reports clearly showing that the silica was embedded within the many multiple tissues, including the lung biopsy that was done, for example. So what happens is, if you remove that dye load all of a sudden, guess what? That dye that is floated around kind of diffuses away in the pool. Now, I'm trying to put the two and two together and I'm sure it will make, I cannot prove it. But what happens is that burden at least is diminished, decreased, and now over a period of three months, six months, nine months, the body system eliminates just process of diffusion you know, through the liver, through the kidney, God knows how, I do not know, but at least there is no continued insult. So the patients have this dramatic and continued bounce back, what would be good recovery after removal, what would be the implant plus the capsule and any inflamed tissue. So that now the body is in equilibrium and it has a way to kind of quote detox because the surgery cleared up all of these badness, if that makes sense. Now, more research needs to be done. If there is an antidote that needs to kind of contain the silicon and remove it, I know of none. There are patients that I've managed that have had silica injected in the buttock area in order to enhance the, uh, the aesthetics of the back, for example. She did not want to get the BBL. Now, you see the silicon grade now in Florida and New York, you see some of these pseudoplastic surgeons injecting. These are patients that have these masses and silica embedded within their breast tissue or in their other. Uh, th this is very hard to remove till it's removed physically. This is where the surgeon has to remove that burden such that the patient bounces back to a normal state of good health. Uh, so going back to the, 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 the detox 
the best detox is complete and definitive removal of the implant capsule plus any inflamed tissue such that none of it remains behind. Uh, so what we're trying to figure out what's actually happening during the recovery phase with regards to the pectoral muscles, specifically above the muscle implants. Now what happens is this, if you can imagine the muscle is sitting on the chest, this is the pectoralis muscle. And what I'm going to do is what I've done in the past, if I may show, uh, I'm actually going to go to my uh, phone and I'm going to go ahead and show this. So if you can see, this is the pectoralis uh, muscle and you can see the insertion of it is on the upper part of the bicep and the rest, the origin uh, is on the sternum and on the lower part where it is anchored, if you will. Now, if you tighten your upper arm, you, like when you're lifting something heavy, for example, when you're lifting, uh, uh, let's say, a 20-pound object or you're flexing hard, you're going to inevitably use that pectoralis muscle. Imagine the dissection done below the muscle and on top of the rib. That muscle is elevated up. Sometimes it window shades up and that muscle needs to settle. And especially where that three, four, five, six hundred cc implant was sitting, there is that big void. And in the case where the implant was above, it is more visual and more kind of at the surface. So there is that void. Now, what happens is when the surgery is done right, the fascia of the pectoralis, the fascia of the intercostal and the serratus is essentially removed. What happens is the muscle of the pectoralis, in those cases where the implant is below the muscle it sits onto the rib and given the compression with both the bra and the binder it adheres and once the muscle adheres the breast tissue that's on top kind of sits up and gets a recoil not only from the skin but also from the the ligaments within the breast tissue that hold the breast tissue together so in the 20 30 40 year old there are relatively very taut i.e uh very elastic -y, uh, breast tissue so it recoils better versus the 70 year old where you don't have much the elasticity of not only the skin but the breast tissue is gone so in those patients where the implant sitting above we don't want shear forces of the skin and the breast tissue against the muscle so that's why the compression not only on the chest but kind of a recoil helps heal if you can imagine just as an, uh, an analogy imagine the implant was on your thigh uh, underneath the thigh muscles, for example, a 500 cc implant that I removed today was underneath the thigh muscles. And you can imagine that the muscle is attenuated, it's lifted up. If that implant is removed, what's going to happen? The muscle is going to want to sit back onto the femur. In this case, the pectoralis is going to want to sit back onto the rib. And the compression, i.e. with the ACE wrap, would allow for the muscle to adhere and normalize and equilibrate and heal such that that void where that implant was gets a chance to be addressed. No need for drains because it was done in a very nice, sophisticated way without hurting the muscle or the other tissues. And there is no inflamed tissue remaining behind. If there is no remaining, everything should heal. And the body in itself has this amazing capacity to absorb anything 30 cc's or less. Certainly, there is some production of some fluid as a result of surgery. Now, going back to, we need to let this settle, and that's why the T-Rex arms are critical, so that you're not reaching for that heavy swing door or lifting uh, the cute 15-pound baby, because you don't want to flex the pectoralis against the rib and also against the breast tissue. So we want to let that heal. And from my experience of having repaired a lot of arm muscles, uh, neck, back, leg trauma muscles, it takes on average six weeks, even for tendon repair from the hand, that before I subject my patients to basically gentle exercises, actively building muscle, that's usually at the six to eight week mark and every patient being different. So hopefully that answers the question. So that is the the the, the commitment the patient has, the compliance, and as you will see where the patients are like overdoing it, they're moving their arms or their compliance, say for example, 70% of the time, this inevitably puts pressure on the incision and on the breast tissue. And you will see uh, the post-op day number nine patient, nine days after, or post-op day number 11, this is the patient's flexing and extending. They're going to spasm or they're going to hurt because they know deep, deep down within. They even send me in their text, I think I was overdoing it. And I say, you bet, because you have to T-Rex 
This is the nature of the post-operative recovery. Much less so for the implant that is placed above the muscle because that's easy surgery. My best case scenario is a young healthy female with no comorbidities, no diabetes, no prednisone, none of this lupus or none of the significant Crohn's disease patients, for example, that are prone to scarring. Uh, a patient who is young, no medications, saline implants above the muscle, and I don't care how long ago was it done. That is the best case scenario because I know I'm not going to be dissecting off of the rib. I know the implants are not ruptured and I know uh, that uh, the dissection is going to be relatively uh, quick with a nice rebound in what would be a young healthy patient. Now having said this, there are patients that I've operated on that are 81 year old, my eldest uh, patient, and she's done extremely well along with the many 60, 70 patients who have been sick, for example, with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis since age five, and they've been on prednisone, for example, another nice patient of mine from Jersey. Mm -hmm. She's been uh, on prednisone for 40 uh, years. The results can absolutely be attained, and it just takes a little bit of patience without the need for drains. I did an 800cc patient that came to me from Los Angeles, large implants, uh, uh, mastectomy patient. She was on five of prednisone, no need for drains, and she did very well. And again, she was very compliant. Compliance makes my life very easy because it allows for what would be a good definitive recovery. Now, what I want to do is uh, 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 let me go ahead and um, I'm going to actually see, uh, I'm going to answer uh, we're one hour. I'm going to answer the questions. So I'm actually going to go to my other phone and I'm going to see uh, some of the uh, patients uh, that... Uh, have asked me the questions so I can answer uh, to everyone uh, who has had uh, the questions. Uh, now, I want you to go see the difference between on my YouTube channel, uh, what's n block, what's 100% total capsulectomy, what's a partial capsulectomy, and what's a capsulotomy. And I describe, so for those ladies, this is a very hard definition and I follow it strictly. Uh, there, is, even if it's a millimeter break in the capsule, that does not make it an end block. That makes it what is a hundred percent total capsulectomy because uh, the word end block means it was pristinely removed definitively. Uh, can you address retained capsules? So very important. So retained capsules. You know. Uh, so I got a question uh, just yesterday from a patient, and over the weekend, this uh, lady that I mentioned about forty-two years of age, she got her. Uh, capsules supposedly removed from a plastic surgeon who told her she would, who still augments. And initially he threw her off. He said, uh, you know, I'm not a believer in BI, but she wanted to proceed because of his reputation. Now, going back to her case, she had implants. So this is very interesting. She had implants initially first set above the muscle, second set below the muscle with the current implants. And she had muscle repair that needed to be done. She had the surgery done through a 2.5 centimeter incision. Now uh, there are automatically three big red flags. 2.5 centimeter, you cannot repair muscle, you cannot let alone see. Number two, she had two sets of implants, two sets of capsules, right? The first one above, so that capsule needs to be removed and she said that he did remove that as well. And then done two hours, impossible, physically impossible. In my mind from the a few that I have done with the implant capsule was above because that has to be removed the capsule below and along with what would be the muscle repair you're looking at six and a half seven hours because this is what it entails to do the job right definitively because you have to dissect above the muscle below so what I say I need the operative record because that is the legal bind I had a question just right now when I was driving home I called this nice pleasant lady she is from New York and I told her, I need to see the operative record. Four years ago, she had explantation done, but capsule supposedly left behind. So I want to know. Now, what's interesting is the surgeon's right, a capsulectomy was performed. Now, it could be a complete capsulectomy partial. And then you look at, uh, you know, the terminology, the decision and the determination of the surgeon from the time in, time out of the surgery. I look at uh, the nature and quality of the capsule. So the next thing I want to see the pathology report. Well, guess what? No pathology report was done because none of the capsules were sent. Now we do not know. Were there any pictures? Well, the plan was to get pictures and video, but there was a problem with the camera. Now all of a sudden you have red flags. 
and you can see she is very frustrated. She is not well off financially and she's now looking forward to what would be another operation. This is the patient out of Illinois with all due respect to her. Now I want to get an MRI with and without contrast just so that I can define the planes, the lymph node status, for example. She could very well have had, uh, uh, you know, excellent surgery by this uh, surgeon. So I'm going to be uh, giving the benefit of the doubt to the surgeon till I see the operative record and till I see the MRI and then I'll put the two and two together and then assess what are the many signs symptoms of BIA that the patient continues to have. Now if she's fresh out I want to see if she recovers optimally and what are the symptoms. The ultimate and only true way for me to tell if there are residual capsules is if I go and make the cut and look again because you cannot tell by the MRI and you cannot sometimes tell by the operative record if there was a definitive uh, effort made by this plastic surgeon to remove the entirety of the capsules. Uh, one patient called and said, my, my, my surgeon did the uh, surgery uh, and he took my insurance and I was so happy and thankful that he took my insurance. Guess what? The surgery was done in an hour and 15 minutes and the capsules were left behind. And unfortunately, she needs to come back for residual capsules. This is the whole bond. This is what the consent should and must say. I'm block or 100% total capsulectomy, complete definitive removal of the capsule and all inflamed tissue and implants to be returned to the patient. This is the legal bind that the patients have with their plastic surgeons so that there is no doubt what was going to be done because this is the agreement, the understanding, and you have to rely on the surgeon's reputation, professionalism, integrity, not only from you, but the many other surgeons, the many other patients that the surgeon has operated on because that is solidifies the fact. And I want to check and balance on me such that I continue. There are surgeons that I know who start off nicely and faithfully, but then as we move forward, they're kind of rushing through the surgery because deep down within, they truly do not believe in breast implant illness. My MD says metals are everywhere. That is true. If you go to Louisiana, if you drink the Flint water, you're going to get the heavy metals, lead, and everything. That is true. Um, guess what? The, 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 the capsules have in it, the silica. Look at the many path reports. Uh, that is not a justification to leaving behind the capsules. Look, number one, many patients who have had successful removal of residual capsules such that they ended up getting a second surgery and ended up getting what is the true explant surgery initially, bounce back. Patients who had removal of the implant uh, and the capsule was left behind and they underwent a surgery for removal of residual capsules and you see now they bounce back. We know of another case where the plastic surgeon said she removed the, uh, the patient plastic surgeon removed the entirety of the capsule. Lo and behold, the patient didn't bounce back and she basically sought consultation with another plastic surgeon and lo and behold, the capsule was right there on the chest and the patient knew that there was capsule remaining behind. Look, a small amount of silicone is enough to continue to impart what would be an immune response. Look at the vaccine someone gets for like MMR, for example, right? It's that small amount of antigen that's introduced into the arm and that continues or starts a trigger response by the body and launches what are in antibodies, right? Same thing, we have residual silica and you see and see the silicon mastitis, the inflammation, the burden and all what is the enhanced immune system that the body basically mounts up in order to fight. You don't want to leave any of that burden behind. So yes, true, metals are everywhere, but this is, look at the ingredient list of the silicon, uh, the silicon uh, implants or the sealing implants. It's all these metals, platinum and zinc and whatnot else. And you can see they continue to trigger. That's not a reason to leave the capsules behind. Uh, my surgeon said he believes in it because he sees the difference in the women. Uh, uh, there, there you go. And you know, it doesn't take much. Just look at some of my, my videos, um, you know, and it doesn't take much. You show it to a third grader, they're going to run away. They're going to be so scared by what happens when the capsules are open, right? No person in their sane mind can say, well, it all happens to 2%. No, it happens eventually. You never know where you're going to have that bacterial burden that the patient is living with or that significant thick uh, paste 
or the many patients with that calcified scaly uh, capsules or even thin capsules once they're removed, you see the patients bouncing back. Implants are only bad, replete with problems. And I say in my clinic, no one walks in my clinic and says the implants are making me healthy. They only hurt the body. Now, one thing that I guessed a lot, why are you so, why are you doing this? Why are you taking on this challenge and swimming against the stream? Well, I will say it doesn't take much. It's one plus one is two. Two plus two is four. Four plus four is eight. And this is exactly the same math. You look at the implants, you look at the saline and silicone, you put the two and two together. You look at the pathology reports. One after another, you see chronic inflammation, all the badness, and you see the patient sponsored back when the implants are removed right and you the, you see the patients bouncing back when the residual capsules are removed. And all of this is suggestive and indicative of the badness of the implants, the same reason why the implants were banned in the 92. And so we're basically seeing history repeating itself. Can you address retain capsules? I did. Uh, the next, uh, uh, we need to do a lot of talking. Um, you know, if 20, 30, 40 plastic surgeons start talking like I am tonight, and I will tell you, the world will be a different place in one week. Uh, we need to get more of the word out. And I've mentioned this before. you got the FDA that's moving at a snail's pace. Uh, congratulations to the leadership and the board of the FDA to on October the 27th, mm -hmm. taking the initiative and basically making it what is a mandate for the plastic surgeons to discuss. We need to step up. The leadership role should be, well, we're going to ban implants, put a halt till we figure this out. That is the right answer, not this passive, uh, politically correct move of slowly but surely trying to stop uh, the augmentation. Number two, the plastic surgeons are not talking about it, let alone printing it, uh, what is BII and actively discussing. Yes, we are a good, a good honest professional group of people but now looking at all this mass movement of the women empower, empowering each other this is what's driving the FDA and the complaints this is something that if you look at the slides they're speaking for themselves if you look at the pathology reports they're speaking for themselves and the masses and this is what we need to address such that we basically do no harm which is basically the ultimate goal um, and so for me, you know, I get this last a lot. What is your drive? I said, I just want to help the people. I have nothing to gain. And uh, actually, if you ask me, I have only financial loss because I'm not augmenting. I would love to drive a nice fancy car and a nice house and do all sorts of, but not at the expense mm -hmm. of my patients. And this is only for the benefit of the patients and nothing else but that. Um, what is your opinion about fat grafting. So fat grafting, a very bad idea, according to my professional opinion and my humble opinion. If you fat graft on the face, we're using the Coleman technique, 30% of the fat is going to die, even in the best of the hands. If that fat grafting is done to the breast tissue where there's already inflamed tissue, guess what? At least 30%, 40%, 50% of the fat is going to die. Now you're going to feel clumps and you can only inject 100 cc's, which is almost a fourth or a little bit more than a third of a Coke can, which is nothing. And half of it is going to die. And now you're going to feel what would be clusters of fat necrosis and maybe inflammation in an area that's already inflamed and may lead to infection among others and something that I would not advise. And now someone gets a mammogram the next year, it will highlight what would be these coat masses, which may truly be fat necrosis or maybe, uh, God forbid, uh, uh, breast cancer and we don't want to complicate the post um, mammogram by unnecessary uh, biopsies. Leave the chest alone. I'm a big fan of DNT. DNT means do not touch. Uh, you know, uh, I, and meaning do no harm, do not touch. Uh, I love to operate but no reason for what would be a justification for fat transfer. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, the next question is um, uh, my, uh, my surgeon told me, uh, he told me, uh, he got all capsules out from the four augmentations, but how can we be sure? Remember those five criteria? Uh, the surgeon has to believe, he has to tell you if you're not going to get those five criteria, the size of the incision, the length of time, the video, the returning of the implant, and the repetition of the surgeon, uh, you're not going to know uh, 
definitively with certainty, um, uh, you know, that the entirety of the capsules were removed, plus any inflamed tissue. Um, what I'm going to do next is, um, I have my high school friend watching me, uh, so I just want to say a quick hello. Uh, uh, sorry, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at some more questions so I can answer. Now, end block surgery, believe it or not, is, you know, uh, this is something that is new. No one is taught end block. There is no book chapter that teaches uh, breast implant illness and how to manage. This is something that we're learning. You know, I, I propose this. All the explant surgeons who, you know, need to get together and with all humbleness and all integrity, all for the benefit of the patients, that we discuss, share data, and we have grants, and we have a task force that groups together and looks and analyzes the data, and we have something. You know, we, we're, we're, we're dealing with a cure. We're looking at relief of symptoms that we sit together very humbly for the benefit of the patient. I have no ill will against anyone except for what is to help patients. To be honest, if I just come home and sleep reasonably uh, and eat and spend time with my family, that's all what I want. Uh, and I just want to help and hopefully help all my patients in the best capacity and best manner possible such that they get the best relief and they get a bounce back to a normal state of health so that each one of you ladies and their significant others go back to enjoying life without the misery of what is breast implant illness, which is a real problem. And if we can, which is only a matter of time before we do that, and, uh, you know, learn from what I have had to quote, self-taught, how I do it, where I now have a track record of doing so many patients in the manner and the way that I do, and in a very safe, controlled way, such that I don't take the chances, uh, you know, and I take the patients very appropriately to the hospital setting versus my surgery center, so that the patient gets 100% the same treatment that, for example, you know, the, the president would get, you know, so that you get the utmost care and each and every single patient is taken seriously. Every chart, every line is read by my nurse, uh, by myself, uh, by Jennifer, it's screened. Uh, you know, there are questions back and forth. I've canceled many surgeries at the last second. You know, people ask me just the other day, just so that you're aware. Um, I had a patient uh, three weeks ago. She had COVID uh, in the first week of September, and then she lived with the COVID for almost three weeks. She didn't get the vaccine, uh, but important to discuss. And the next thing you know, she was on the pregnancy zone. I listened to her lungs. And to my surprise, I said, how did your primary approve you for this surgery? And this is a very reputable institution here, right here in um, the Michigan area. And I overrode everyone. And I said, surgery canceled for her own good. And the next thing you know, you can hear the, uh, the, 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 the post-op COVID syndrome in her uh, lungs and uh, you know she's going to be successfully uh, you know according to the textbook the the uh, the criteria she should have sought surgery at least two months after her and this is where she's going to go another patient that I she got in the pre-op area she was noted to be pregnant so she was instantly canceled she said she was willing to proceed and sign as absolutely 100 percent is not going to happen till she delivers and she comes back 10 uh, months later another patient listen to her wheeze and to my surprise and I asked her I called her primary right there in Texas and I said what's going on how come I'm hearing your patient wheeze and it turns out she did not want to take that steroid medication because that makes her put on the weight surgery instantly canceled she took a trip from Texas to me for nothing till she got optimized another patient she had uh, what was uh, severe chemical sensitivity and what would be a panic attack. She needed to be optimized on psych meds before I would operate on her because I did not want her to operate on the, uh, basically have issues on the OR table or in the recovery. So again, the goal here is perfection and looking back and saying, taking zero chances. Um, you know, if the thought crosses my mind that the patient needs to be done at the hospital, I take care of the patient at the hospital because that's the safer, better place. 
I don't like any surprises on the OR table and neither do my patients once I explain to them as why. Um, so um, um, so I, I say to you, so my pathology shows um, staph. Now it's very common, someone, you know, the very common bacteria as you will see, and now this is important, sometimes the capsular contracture is associated with bacterial colonization, just like any uh, um, foreign body sometimes, and the bacteria kind of lives, if you will, uh, with the implant till it is removed. Now this is important, the capsular contracture has been shown sometimes to be associated with bacteria, and it is integral important uh, to send cultures off for what is this quote mysterious look at the mold look at the bacterial propiobacteria or cutibacterium achenes that has been noted uh, by the microbiology report to be the most common organism i give antibiotics iv right before i make incision uh, according to the standard of care and i give my patients antibiotics mm -hmm. for a seven day course because i don't want any infection and thank god to date knock on wood i have had zero infections uh, and, uh, you know, the utmost care that my team takes, each one is handpicked so that they deliver the best personal care to all my patients. And hopefully my patients realize that and they realize this very well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to answer one more question and hopefully we will call this, uh, a, another Facebook live. I will do one more, like I said, with my next guest. She's a patient of mine. I did it at her at the hospital. She uh, was going to share with us uh, her experience. We're going to go over her uh, end block that I did at the hospital. Um, and uh, we will go over as to why and how I worked her up and uh, what were the, her experiences like uh, having undergone the surgery at the hospital. As you will see, I handpicked the team. Uh, I made the phone calls uh, the week before and with the right team, I wanted to get the best anesthesiologist, the best uh, and under whatever control that I would had, such that everyone knew why I wanted to proceed in the manner that I do. Um, so let me look at one more question um, and I'll be more than happy uh, to answer. Uh, um, let me look at a question that uh, I find. Now I'm not computer savvy. Um, I do not like to uh, be on the phone much. Uh, that's just me. I'm kind of old-fashioned. Um, let me look at a uh, one more question. So uh, uh, following a moderate hit to the chest, I started experiencing severe symptoms whereby my health deteriorated significantly. Ultrasound revealed snowy-like appearance to the right breast and enlarged lymph nodes indicating rupture. Question, is it common for breasts to, disclose, uh, to display a snowy appearance and large lymph nodes with no rupture? So this is a good question. Now we always are prone to trauma. There are patients that are riding their bike, another bicyclist comes and hits them a car door that the lady was opening all of a sudden because of a wind gust he came and hit her on the chest. Another lady, she was wearing a seat belt. The car spun on ice, ended up in a ditch and she hits the steering. The airbag blows off and all of a sudden instant trauma uh, to this 81 year old's chest that ruptures the implant. Now, a lot of different scenarios fall off the chair. Someone's leaning back and all of a sudden falls back and there is pec all of a sudden contracture or in the many patients that I've heard that they went for a mammogram and they felt what they heard was a pop. Now, first of all, define saline implants versus silicon implants. Saline implants, if they do rupture, they are like a water balloon. Now, I will tell you, this changed two weeks ago for me where I had that white paint contained in what was a very small saline implant that was indeed ruptured, but lo and behold, it had that liquid in it and it did not diffuse through and it was all that bacterial colonization. So that my, that is my end of one, my first experience. It truly, totally did not collapse. So the saline implants in general collapse on themselves and they're like a water balloon or a tire that's flat that you can see it's completely deflated and it essentially falls on itself. And there's a video that I actually I'm going to post in the next day or two where these 
Uh, this patient came in a private jet from Alabama and she had what was deliberate purposeful puncture of her implant by her reputable plastic surgeon such that then she would undergo a second surgery to remove her textured saline implants. So the saline implant, so what I, I would do is if this is rupture deflated, then you need to get this uh, implant out. Obviously, you need to get the implant out regardless. But if this is silicon and there's fear of rupture, the gold uh, standard, i.e. imaging study of choice is a MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, without contrast to determine if the silicon implant is ruptured, yes or no. So MRI without contrast. And once the MRI is done, that will at least tell us if the silicon is intact or not, or if it's free floating or where it is ruptured from. And it will also tell us the status of the lymph nodes and also the tissue of the periphery where you see maybe a focal inflammation or a focal spillage of uh, silicon. And this is where it's important for my, some of my patients where I get an MRI that it helps me understand if the patient is having pain on one side, then I always start off with the good side because I don't want to cross contaminate what would be a spillage of one into the other. So it helps plan my surgery better and also do those out of town patients. If we know there is a frank rupture, like this one nice patient came from Arizona this last week, the MRI stated it was ruptured and it was the Facebook live I did that the implant was above the muscle. In this case, the implant turned out to be below the muscle, number one, and number two, it was not ruptured, it was intact. So it helps plan the surgery better. And then I know it's just like a Navy SEAL mission. You know, you know what the plan is. You come from the helicopter, you go to the compound and you go to that room and get whatever you need and you come right out of Dodge. Same thing with the explant surgery. It's a very defined, it helps me understand what is the status, where is the spillage. And then I make my cut and I approach it in every single way, away from where this focal spillage is, such that I'm able to contain it in the end block. So this is kind of a smart way of showing and seeing what the roadmap is going to be of the surgery. So in that case, if now, if there is a lymph node, I'm always thinking malignancy, 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 because one out of eight or nine women are going to get cancer. So I want to go ahead and see if this is a really large node, then under local and a good general surgeon who can biopsy it and then send it off to see if this is breast cancer. God forbid the implant might be hiding what would be a mass in the proximity of the implant, right? So that needs to be by the workup needs to be done. To be complete, I do not want to take a chance and operate and the next thing you know, this is stage three or stage four cancer because there is a palpable lymph node. Now it could be a palpable lymph node just from the inflammation that's present on the vast majority of the ladies. You see the dilated veins on the chest and the inflammatory burden that grows into the axilla. That's where the lymph node basin is. So now we have enhanced, i.e. we want to rule out the breast cancer. We want to make sure, and it's a relatively quick operation under local where the lymph node is sent, it's not going to cause any lymphedema and that helps plan and understand what would be it. And in this case, if there is, uh, you know, the, the giant cell reaction, there is um, the macrophages, the hysteresitic reaction and uh, suggestions of what may be the silica uh, within the lymph nodes that surely has been shown by Dr. Henry Dykeman again, the, 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 the gel bleed. Now, if the, the implant is intact and the patient is having pain and the lymph node is not cancer, then my recommendation is that the patient get a end block a removal of the entirety of the implant capsule or 100% total capsulectomy such that everything is going to be contained. And now that burden is gone. Now, sometimes people have capsular contracture, inflammation around the many nerves that feed the nipple areola and the breast tissue. Uh, you could have just by association, just like a trauma, a fall, even a fractured grip, for example, from a trauma, uh, you know, that can occur. Uh, or costochondritis can occur, which is inflammation of the ribs or the, uh, the cartilage of the ribs that's present usually on the medial side. So a good workup with the MRI uh, without contrast would be very important in this case and an eventual removal of the uh, implant plus capsule plus any inflamed tissue that might be a focal burden such that the patient gets the best chance to bounce back to a normal state of good health. Now, having said this, um, I want to go ahead and thank everyone, each one of my listeners and viewers. 
Um, you know, with all due respect to my colleagues, I am so grateful to all, uh, you know, I'm learning from my patients, you know, I'm listening to my patients, I'm listening to my other plastic colleagues, I'm reading the articles, I'm reading, uh, you know, Dr. Atul Mehta's um, case reports, other case reports, the research articles that are coming out one by one in the many journals. I thank my colleagues, my plastic surgery colleagues, everyone. And again, as we move forward, better define the path that leads to a better quality of life for the many patients who have implants who are hurting and do not know why. BII is as real as any other illness. It deserves a new and itself an ICD-10 code. It needs recognitions by the insurance companies. It needs recognition of what is the detrimental effects of the, the, the implants such that the patients get a chance to bounce back, not only the patients, but everyone around, their significant others, their sons and daughters, their friends, their neighbors, so that we have these ladies be productive again who've signed up for disability or who are basically fall out of their uh, career path, uh, you know, unfortunately because of the, the toxic effects of these uh, silica. Um, I wish everyone the absolute very best. Ask questions, be assertive, be uh, reasoning. We will meet again with our next uh, guest, which is a patient of mine um, who uh, is a nurse, and we will ask her uh, questions. The other patients can ask questions so that we can learn from her and help uh, us, including myself, understand what and how she went through her journey and to get the explant and how she has bounced back. Again, God bless you all. Take care. All the very best and have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.